2024. This is the Hadley Climate Change Committee meeting at the Hadley Senior Center. And I'm calling the meeting to order. And our first piece of business is to approve last month's minutes. So anything on the meeting? So a comment about the minutes is said that we were going to compose a letter to the different restaurants. We don't have the authority, we don't have the power, we're not the Board of Health or the others, so we cannot do that. Okay, so we're not going to do that. So that's one thing that we cannot do. Well, and one thing, the one place that we were concerned about is Wendy's because they don't have any outdoor trash bins. But you didn't find any Wendy's trash on the ground, right? Right. So when we did the pickup, we weren't scouting for where it was it coming from. It was pretty much a general mix of trash. Right. So, I'm yeah. just saying. It was no one particular restaurant. There was something from just about every restaurant. Okay. So any, any, any um, corrections anybody has for the last one? Do I have a motion to approve? I move they get approved. Second. I'll second that. All right. We all agree? Are you guys? No. Okay. Agreed. Approved. Michael, was that a yes vote? Yes, it was. Sorry. <laughs> no, just double checking. So we have two people to talk to us tonight. Do you want to take this? Sure. So Tom and I have known each other for years. <laughs> Ever. Forever. And Tom did an interesting study, if you will, with his graduate students about the Climate Change Committee. And you have the results and some of the information, so please, can you summarize yeah, yeah, what I'm gonna you do found out? Yeah, thank you. So what an opportunity this was. Uh, I worked with 17 master's students at Elms College this past spring. Uh, the course is um, Current Events and its Impact on the Economy. And so they were looking for what was happening, and they wanted to get their feet on the ground, something local where they can make a difference and have an impact. And uh, of course, I knew Jack, I knew the Climate Change Committee, and they took to it like a magnet. Uh, the students broke into three teams, and I just want to hit some of the highlights of this, uh, not all 40 plus pages. Um, I thought that might be a little pushy. Yet. I do want to say what you're about to hear is an affirmation of there's nothing new here. It's like patting you on the back. You should, this is a feel good night for you. <laughs> according to these graduate students at Elms College. Um, they, first of all, they loved the research. They did their in-depth research. Um, it, it was more of a confirmation that what you did is right, what you're doing is right, and what you're planning is right. And they back it up with documentation from folks across the globe. I won't get into those um, references, but they're in these documents that I think you all have received. Um, so the first team, uh, was uh, focused on the intersection of sustainability practices and net economic outcomes. It analyzed how Hadley's environmental, environmental efforts affect the town's bottom line and market positioning. It also investigated how sustainability practices can drive innovation and competitive advantage in the market. And some of the highlights, again, all good stuff. They love you, they love what you're doing, they want you duplicated across uh, the country. Uh, in terms of the recycling program, they thought there could be more incentives to encourage citizens, though, to, to use the program. I mean, this is not a criticism. They're just building on your success already and reduce their waste. The natural recycling process of organic matter, which converts plant waste and food scraps into healthy nutrients that enhance soil and vegetation by stopping methane emissions, uh, they recommend you do that and continue to do that. Uh, they recommend that we continue, you, the committee, to reduce the amount of water consumed by citizens, uh, conserving water would use less natural resources, and contribute to the recycling efforts. They talked about an article, More Food, Less Water, and, and it had top, the top farming practices, um, six of them, to better manage water. And um, this includes improving soil conservation, planting perennial crops using mobile technology, improving rainwater harvesting, implementing micro-irrigation, and using intercropping. We, a lot of our folks do that already, and you're proponents of that. Again, affirmation. Uh, they're big proponents of solar panels, and so am I. <laughs> uh, wind and water turbines. We're gonna get a little bit into that later, because uh, we don't see a lot of those. For our vehicles and our homes, and they highlight that almost anything can be done to reverse the effects of climate change due to pollutants. 
They did highlight that the agricultural sector consumes about 69% of the planet's fresh water, and that's cited and documented. <clears throat> There's an article that says green innovation is not only good for containing climate change, but for stimulating economic growth too, with citation. Once these initiatives are established in Hadley, neighboring towns can adapt these sustainable practices supporting the global uh, communities following your lead. They put a lot of emphasis on educating the next generation, which of course, 4-H, which is where I worked for 40 years, FFA, all those, I, I'm a hardy proponent. Uh, educating students about farming increases interest in the field and grows the knowledge and workforce within the ag industry. This benefits the economy as it creates jobs and ensures that society is more aware of how to conserve and support sustainable initiatives. Regarding agriculture education, it does not just mean teaching about farming. It explores and discusses topics that contribute to the world around us. They talked about some statistics with numbers that recycling and reuse activities in the U.S. account for 681 thousand jobs, 37.8 billion in wages, and 5.5 billion in tax revenues. Supporting recycling is a vital part of encouraging communities to be in charge of creating a more robust economy, plus it's the right thing to do. And, and to end this teams, um, they said that it's apparent that Hadley's Climate Change Committee is one of the leaders in the area. So, uh, so where were they getting all the information about the work Everywhere. They, they, they were looking within the past five years for research articles. So they were looking at journal articles from across the globe. Anywhere. So they just typed in key, the keywords, kind of like I do for my dissertation, and see what's out there and what's current. The second team. Well, me, I want to ask you so did they look at what other. Um, they couldn't find much outside of towns that we're doing? Yeah. Huh? There's none that compares to us. Or you compared to you? Oh, well, they, although they, there's they a number of communities, <laughs> you know, East Hampton, for example, yeah. where they have an energy committee. Yep. Leverett, for example, they have an energy committee. So sometimes it's just under a different name. Different name, yeah. And similar intent. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the round of the sub very robust Super. They may have been holding in on climate change. Committees, maybe. Yeah, because uh, that's what they really had last that time. To know. Yeah, no, no. Energy and sustainability and right you know, words like that. Yeah, because that was the name we were given by Christian Stanley a few years ago. Okay. And in some ways, good thing. In some ways, it can be a controversial thing. I mean, right. Right. Have right. Different attitude. If yeah. You've been looked at what Amherst is doing and Northampton. Well, if you know the, the names are different, but they're the same. Kind of the same push, the same resolve, the same intent. Yeah. These students would have put back and they love it. What did the other group okay. say? Okay. The second one examined the economic implications of corporate social responsibility and initiatives in Hadley that were taking place. And it assessed Hadley's community, uh, corporate social responsibility, and the HCCC as, it, as to the impact on the bottom line in social welfare. Um, they talked about helping the town evaluate, choose, and implement actions that promote sustainable uh, practices. They talked about your annual report that was done two years ago, I guess, by Pedro Juan de Jesus, is that correct? Uh, an MBA grad student at Elms College. Somebody found that somewhere. <laughs> um, and they found that we covered a lot of corporate social responsibility initiatives developed by HCCC. Um, they had positive intentions, but their criticism, slight criticism, is that some of those were immeasurable. The impacts were being made, but we didn't know by how much. And they thought if that could be enhanced, take a closer look at that, it might uh, bring in more support because people could see the change in terms that they could talk about, not just fluffy pie in the sky stuff. Uh, the initiative should be listed, but data on behalf of plastic waste reduction percentages or similar details should be added. If you look at that report, they talked about two of your big days, spring cleanup, mm -hmm. and also the Have the Climate Day, and they loved the involvement. Uh, they would recommend possibly trying to do all the things you're doing, but promote it even more so. So their question was, how do you get people to buy into these events? And they talked about multiple partnerships that go into these events, and yet their attendance is in accordance to the specific events, and it didn't carry forward to something else potentially, and, and they want to. We need to gain that same attention for initiatives such as the composting, composting, plastic reduction bylaw, 
and becoming a green community. They then asked the question again, how do we get that attention? The HCCC should start by strategically developing evaluative measures to ensure that they are calculating the interests of the citizens. What do the citizens like? What do they want to see? What do they need? Uh, how can we provide it? What, what, we do, what do we need to provide it and more? Provide the citizens with surveys, voting, focus groups, and more opportunities that involve these questions will increase interest and attendance. Um, marketing these corporate social responsibilities, they talk about all the business in town. They said they can be monitored through social media, newspapers, and live news, and more. Uh, what they're getting at with that is you've got a lot of people joining you at the corporate level. Let's give them a pat on the back. Let's make sure they get the recognition publicly. And through that recognition, other people might become more involved. And you know, one example of that is Kathy and I had a chance to help over the last few weeks at Gardner Supply when they did a plastic recycling day sure. for planting containers. Mm -hmm. So it's those sorts of things that private companies, or East County Savings Bank has done paper shredding days. Yeah. Different companies, different agencies are doing some different right. things. Right. Again, this isn't, you're doing it. They're confirming it, reaffirming it, and, and applauding you. Uh, one of the highlights here is that, that corporate social responsibility initiatives can promote a sense of purpose and give those employees at those businesses a chance to feel like they're contributing to have it. Well, it and there's a quote oh, with the source. When employees perceive their organization is contributing positively to society, it fosters a sense of pride and enhances their connection to the community, which is what we want. Hadley could also, under um, social welfare flooding and severe storms, Mm -hmm. Hadley could also promote green infrastructure and climate resilience, starting with things like planting trees, nothing new there, restoring wetlands, and installing green roofs. They go hand in hand to promoting sustainable land use practices by implementing zoning regulations, which we do, land use policies, and flood management. Lobbying for increased funding for infrastructure improvements, disaster preparedness programs, and climate adaptation initi initiatives that benefit the community and promote long-term resilience should happen, they're recommending it. How we should establish partnerships with emergency management agencies, I imagine you do, uh, and community organizations to support disaster response. And then they give another pat on the back. Many of these continue through all these documents. Many businesses in Hadley are helping citizens. One they cite is delivering food to the front door, SNAP, being a SNAP member, Another offers next day curbside pickup by orders by phone or online orders. And they talk about the Hadley Senior Center right here, Brown Bag Program, as well as the fuel assistance program that we have. There's a lot, a lot more in here. Um, consumer and stakeholder relations. When it comes to implementing initiatives, the biggest thing to keep in mind is how it impacts the community as they are the primary stakeholders. The main factors we need to highlight are trust, helping a diverse group of people, the economic growth potential, Hadley's reputation, and lastly, the fostering of innovation. There's a famous quote from Lawrence Diggs that states, trust is what makes civilization possible. And it ends this uh, document. This means that HCCC needs to ensure that they are not only accomplishing their goals, but doing so while maintaining and gaining trust from the community. And you do that with every action that you take. The last document, the last team of graduate students explored how recent technological innovations impact various sectors of the economy through um, green industry. Their uh, research focused on solar energy, consumer applications. <clears throat> they said solar energy, as we know, has exploded. We're not only advocates, but we, ha we do have 36 solar panels on our barn. They talk about hydroelectric power, which I thought was kind of out of the realm here, but if you read through this, it makes sense, believe it or not. Another one is wind turbines, which I just don't see for Hadley. You'll find out why later. But, <laughs> but they make a, a good point doing their research and finding a turbine that actually works when you get a wind of only five miles per hour average, which is what it is in Hadley. Um, AI can help um, towns like Hadley in fighting climate change. It can aid in decision making by powering data analytic tools regarding climate, regarding climate change. Water conservation is a good way to improve ecological footprints for Hadley. Uh, it talks about the importance of it. 
Uh, for the farms of Hadley, there's never been a better time to jump in and join in the amazing benefits of solar panel, <coughs> solar energy. Farmers can power the irrigation systems, barns, machinery, and reduce their expenses on inexpensive fuel and minimize their footprint. You're doing it, right? Um, they talk more about uh, all the, the uh, funds you get back through um, residential renewable energy credits and uh, things like that. Additionally, AI can uh, help manage waste more efficiently, monitor air and water quality, and predict natural disasters. They talk about electric vehicles. I think the state as a whole is going that way. Uh, they talked about a nonprofit organization named Ceres. It's formed the Corporate Electri Electric Vehicle Alliance, which is focusing on, on accelerating the transition to electric vehicles. And they thought Hadley should look into joining Ceres um, to transform. Lastly, trucks they talk about that come in and out of the businesses delivering consumer goods a lot along the Route 9 corridor. Uh, there's also a push from a company called No Traffic trying to make lights smarter, traffic lights, so you're not standing at all. I think we're getting better at that. Hydroelectric power, they're talking about an Archi Archimedes hydrodynamic system. I didn't look into it beyond what the report said. I don't know where we would put uh, they, they, they claim they work in small, small areas like Hadley. Um, and we're, uh, the wind energy, so what do I think of that? They talk about vertical windmills versus horizontal. And they claim, he, this, this researcher, this student claims that it works. They're affordable uh, by towns, cities, individuals, corporations. Uh, they're not, they're low to the ground, so they're not the distraction or marring anybody's view of, of anything. Uh, and he's, this guy really convinced me of it when it was all said and done. The vertical axis turbines operate effectively at low wind speed, lower wind speeds. And he's, he researched the average wind speed now, as I said, five miles per hour, which is on the low side for wind energy, but it works with the vertical model he talks, hmm. he talks about. Um, okay, and that's it. Thank you. Well, you it's see, a lot. This is a lot, and you know, they highlight some of the positives, but also it's obvious to us not everybody is in agreement you know when it comes to some of the things we're trying right. some of the things we're doing right. well they refer to that about making sure everybody's on board and probably three or four times they went back to that truck make sure you build trust in the community so it's for all of them. and you're serving everybody that's kind of a neat thing that they got um, in there that they inserted we want everyone to feel that they're part of the team to you know control we Reduce, retain, pull back climate change. They are. Yeah. Yes, so right. Fact. Yeah. So that's good. So I, I'm curious, and John, you might know more about this. I'm under the impression that the state has passed a plastic reduction act recently. Are you tuned well, in? I didn't get into the details. I, I think right. they're extending the scope of the bond no, bill. No, I think just the Senate. Yeah, raising absolutely. deposits to ten cents. Okay. Like, this is what I heard of. And, yeah. And, and and more things are recyclable now. Yeah. Like okay. All but like wine bottles. I, I had heard that the Senate basically had passed what we had passed a couple years ago, uh, oh. where it was reducing single-use plastic bags. Of that, right? <coughs> right. That. I'm not sure the part that I was talking about actually passed. It was proposed, but that part <coughs> I didn't about the. So that passed the Senate, but do you know did it pass the House? Did the governor sign it? Not that I know of, but I'm not really on top I of know. that. I, I think the House has not acted on a lot of stuff yet. They're, yeah. they're behind the Senate and working out their omnibus legislation that to match match or not match what the Senate put, put through. In time is getting tight, yeah, too. They weeks. have until the end of the month. They have 20 days <coughs> left. Okay. Yeah. I think we'll see it in the paper as soon as that happens. Yeah. Because that's been pretty good about following what the Senate has passed on. Yeah. But you as a committee should feel like super energized, super charged, and well, you're it, because all of this is like, wow, how are we there? You're doing it. I mean, I'm reading through this, and, I'm, and these are folks that have nothing you know, to gain by this. They, they did it from a research angle, because that's what this master's program was all about. And they kept coming up with the same conclusions. 
the ACCC is it. This is what we want. This is, this is the model. Plugging along. This is the model. You, I, okay, another quote because you like the mouse that roared. <laughs> it's a little Hadley, but your <laughs> footprint is like outside. It's like what you. And I think other communities. And, you know, after reading this, I thought I knew something about the climate change community. I knew nothing about the change community based on this. this. Is quite a document. It's all said and done. It's pretty hefty. And um, <laughs> if there's nothing new that it reveals. It's, you should be like sleep really well tonight with a smile on your face and feel really good that you're doing all the right thing. Maybe you know three steps forward and one step back, who knows? But the intent's there, the will is there, you're reaching out, the community spirit, you're networking. Well, you know, it was really interesting having an opportunity to sit in on um, a public hearing over at East Hampton and seeing the mayor offering her support for what they're doing yeah. and all of that and you know it, it's it's interesting it really varies from town to town you know as we're looking at climate action plans and all of this it varies greatly from my neighborhood to communities and there were communities that were green communities a decade or more before we were wow. we were one of the last yeah to that particular party and yeah. it was largely well, it, it was kind of I just didn't yeah. get to it. Yeah. I, I, um, I just had a question. Did they have any examples of uh, vertical windmills yeah, being right. successful? Because there was a generation of them 10 or 20 years ago, and they were real bad. Right. And, Are they small? And like they, they look like they look like steel drums. Kind of oh, okay. Go around and, and, and he he got he, and there was a company that was semi-local that was promoted oh, and okay. a lot of people lost a lot of money with them so oh I just I, I, but perhaps the technology has evolved a bit and there's something out there that right I don't know I uh, the guy that was head to his name is Paul that I agree empty uh, he did a separate he was really into this he did a separate document which I'll get to you you can share it with the committee if that's okay yeah. and he does he has actual uh, corporate name and and the miles he has some pictures of it where it does not look like it mars the view uh but yet it's fairly uh inexpensive you know relative to some sort of yeah. jobs and it works and it works yeah. you know great yeah it just hasn't really caught on in this yeah in this valley yeah. when you look at where we are it's just like i said it's five miles an hour what's that yeah. but a little bit by a little bit between solar panels conserving recycling reducing wind power yeah. it's going to add up it's going to Oh, turn this thing around. It turns it around. You can buy them on Amazon. Nah. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Deliver them in the truck. Uh. <laughs> They'll be cheaper next week. <laughs> they are little. I mean, they are. Yeah. Oh, there's several. Let's see. Looks like they're made in China. <laughs> but thank you oh, for the opportunity for our grassroots. They, they look a lot slicker than the ones. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure the technology in 10 that years. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but thank you again. I really appreciate it. Uh, if there's any question, I'll, uh, that is a great example. I'll ask Paul to, I think I actually have this document. I'll share it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah, much. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks for all that you're doing. So 725. Thank you're really you. close. I'm going to catch Jeff with you. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thanks. Tom. Thank you. Bye. Vertical wind turbine, two blades, 400 watts. Blah, blah, blah. $205. So Kathy, if I can jump in, I'll introduce right. John. So coming from the um, East Hampton Energy Committee, is that my understanding of the committee that you serve on? Yeah. Okay. I was the sure advisory committee. Energy the advisory. advisory. Okay. I wanted to make sure. We don't have no, no real power. And your background is working at UMass, and you're retired from that job? Yeah, I was doing recycling waste management for 35 years, okay. mostly with UMass, but also with DEP for eight years. Cape Cod, different stuff. That was my background. And I, um, for the last 10 years of it, uh, my focus was on the energy aspects and the uh, uh, embodied energy in the, in the waste and the products we're throwing out. It's not counted in, in uh, inventories, greenhouse gas inventories. All they count is emissions at a landfill, emissions at a combustion facility, the trucks going to the landfill, the combustion facility. You know, you know, go upstream and look at what greenhouse gases were generated in the, from 
cradle to you know cradle to grave from the production China to here across the ocean and whatever wherever it's going. So anyway, that, that was my interest in the last ten years of trying to trying to boost the motivation for people in the on the campus because um, people stopped worrying about well there's no more landfills they stopped worrying about that was the big rationale in the 80s and 90s we're running out of space we're contaminating the water supply um, and they uh, weren't necessarily seeing the direct cost benefits of recycling over waste trash disposal so well, we we're pushing the energy part of it so we see something like that there's that guy who every year or two writes a, a le, an editorial in the new york times and talks about how yeah how <laughs> energy inefficient it, it is and so what you're saying is that it's just you're just not calculating the embedded energy in the production right basically. right right yeah I, i'm i think i know the ones that they they really make anybody who's in the recycling business and have their part stop because it, it kills motivation by mm -hmm. the public but it misses it misses out a, on a lot of the inner workings and truth of it including the upstream benefits of <coughs> recycling the energy embodied in the products that you are now not having to go mine and process and ship across the world and put in an Amazon truck and come to your house anyway but that's a different topic and so John before you dive into the climate action plan for East Hampton and <coughs> they're sort of on the verge of working on theirs now uh, where did UMass take its waste where did they dump their waste well, we started with the Amherst landfill when I got there. There was like three, four years of the Amherst landfill, and and they got the campus going on uh, a comprehensive recycling program in the early '90s by threatening to fine the university uh, over waste ban violations. You know, from the waste bans, but the state regulations, the backdoor way of making people recycle, so you can't take it. Not that you are going to go to your house, but yeah, if it goes, to, no a, enforcement if it goes to a in a truck into a landfill, that's where they're going to catch them. Anyway, that that threatened UMass back then. It's a it's a mess thing of money into the big facility we had over there, the uh, recycling intermediate yeah. processing facility or waste recovery facility. I call it. Um, we took it to there. Then we took it to different places. So we were going to a South Hadley landfill for a little while. Um, and then we ended up going and going with an intermediary and getting a con bidding out a contract to take care of the collection and disposal part of it. And Wickles had that for Dave Wickles Trucking had that for a lot of years. And it could go different places. Most everything's going out of the Holyoke uh, transfer station now. That's owned by Casella yeah. and out of state. For the most part, it's going out of state. So we're exporting our, our, our waste problem. But hmm. anyway. Um, Zoo, can you bring us up to date on sort of the approach taken by East Hampton on yeah, the climate action plan? Sure. Yeah, I can give you a link. This is now a public draft that's on the city's website that they're soliciting public comment for for I don't know how much longer. It the link wasn't percent. working last week. Oh really? The link to the climate action plan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll take a look and see if I can help you afterwards with that. But uh, I can also just send you the the link I have or the document. It's, it's actually a PDF I have. Um, just send it to your email or to you, and you can just refer. Uh, it's it's long, and I hesitate to. I mean, we can skim through and get a look at certain portions, but I hesitate to, you know, take it through kind of like page by page. So let, let's oh, back it up oh, just yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And why why an action plan for East Campton? Um, how, how did you vary from the very beginning yeah. get started? Like, um, who, who was in on it? Well, I think it is inspired both by other cities like Northampton and Amherst and others uh, deciding they needed a climate action plan if they're going to organize their efforts and, and see them to their end and, and do stuff that's relevant. Right. And, um, at the same time, um, I, I retired in 20, and I think I got involved with our the end of 21, the beginning of 20, <coughs> I got involved with this Energy Advisory Committee in East Hampton. And um, that was just when the state roadmap 2050, net zero 2050 yep. plan was coming out. Um, Reduce this much, this much. 
Yeah, and all, all with all the scenarios they, they studied, it was, I thought it was a really, really good plan. Um, I'm not an expert, but I've seen a lot of studies and reports. I thought they did a really thorough job of looking at alternatives. And I think that inspired some of the towns. The towns want to get in line with, you know, thinking, well, if, if we can do this on the state level uh, and they're going to support towns, we need to be ready to do our part um, and um, know what we can do and what we can't do on our own. Um, so I got on two years ago. It hadn't really been talked about too much. Uh, there was a lot of transition in the committee when I first got there two years ago, two and a half years ago. And about a, two years ago, we got a new chair, Jamie Paquette, who was the guy leading the, the municipal aggregation hearing. Uh, and he's been really good. And, Is that uh, a paid position or volunteer? No, these are volunteers, yeah. yeah. Um, How many in your committee, roughly? Yeah, I think we have five now. Okay. It was down to three for a while, and yeah, up to five. And I, maybe the climate action process, planning process, and public process will hopefully bring in some more people to to help with the execution of the plan. You know, once it's settled up. Well, it can be so hard in these small communities for yeah. finding people so to actually right. volunteer. Right. So does East Hampton have like a Paid sustainability coordinator. We, we are. We have one advertised now, mm -hmm. um, or it's close to being advertised. It's been approved, I think, by the mayor and the city council. Um, we that role was being filled largely by, with some help from our town planner Jeff Bag, um, the conservation agent mm -hmm. was doing their job. Plus, really, they kind of did mostly this for the last two, year and a half, two years. Um, and he said they're only four day a week person too. So there's going to be a position. Um, I don't know. It just made sense to to us. We saw the towns doing it. it. Made sense that we want to look systematically at what we have to do to get to net zero. Um, what it's going to cost. You know what? How? How? You know, where you get the biggest bang, bang for the buck? You know, what are the roles of the various departments in town? What do residents and businesses have to do? And uh, I actually. I think, uh, I'll do a disclaimer to begin with, I actually think that in some ways, I guess it's good for a thought process to get the whole town and the committee going through a thought process. We, we spent $150,000 um, on this, and I don't think everyone's going to have that budget. And the reason was partly because they, they saved up um, infrastructure money, grant money, federal infrastructure money, or was it leftover COVID money? I can't remember what to bump in a bunch, a third of it or half of it. ARPA and then, funds or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, and then yeah. I got, and then we got uh, so it was state, just to hire state money to, to match it. Yes, to hire, and we have Weston and Sampson. Okay. And yeah, so our budget is zero. Yeah, we had no budget yeah, except I for mean, this. Yeah, I know. It, it, was, it was the town. It would have to be special money right, would have right. to be. Yeah. yeah. But what is it, Weston and what? Weston and Samson. Um, so, I mean, the first thing is what you know. What are your goals for doing it? I mean, and it, it's easy to say to get to net zero. Um, but I think it's good to keep keep an eye on why. To you know, there was an emphasis with people on our committee of wanting to have something that's out there and people can look at it on you know at least the, the actions and the, the implementation plans on the web or elsewhere where they can see what progress is being made where we're falling flat you know yeah. <clears throat> where we need to put more effort what's not working what is working and so um, there's going to be a web component to it including educational stuff for residents yeah people are talking about putting out a, a booklet at first and we said people are going to take a booklet about all their incentive programs and opportunities to get help or tax credits or whatever and they're going to recycle it or you know lose it and in in six months it'll be updated so the yeah, idea was for the consultant to put all that information on the web for for residents and businesses um so they you know they want and also the purpose of having it there look i su suggested that is accountability to ourselves and to the public it's out there we're not just you know yeah, a little quiet little plan here that nobody really knows about. Um, the other, uh, the so other big question is whether you're looking at just the town town operations of the whole the mm -hmm. whole community. Well, and it seems like it needs 
mean, we don't want people, it's not us telling people they have to do stuff. It's here's how you can do it when it's right for you. It, it's just making all the information about incentives and stuff available to people, right? I mean, isn't that um, what you guys are doing? Yeah, but maybe with a little push, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, uh, it's like, you know, this yeah. is what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so do you have permission to show us some of this? Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna out, just keep getting to the how we got to where we. Where but yeah, we, I'm very interested in those very first steps. Like, at what point did you hire Weston and Samson? Pretty early on. Uh, yeah, last last February, I think. Uh, February is when, roughly when we, we, they got a contract. It was advertised in like December. Well, I wasn't advertised. It was negotiated. I, that's one thing I didn't like about our process was this company that had already been working with the town on other stuff, and through some detail of state bidding laws, we're allowed to just hire them to do this work. I didn't necessarily think they would be the best one, but they've turned out pretty good. Uh, I, I've heard of them before. That wasn't that. their focus. They've been mostly a civil engineering, waste, waste, you know, landfills, that kind of a firm, but from what I know, environmental engineering, but not so much this. There's others who specialize in climate, you know, climate planning. And, and so, so far you've talked about cost, but what's the, score. What's the impact? Like, how do you get those monies back? Uh, well, they well, hired we gotta, yeah. to do a job. Yeah. I mean. um, well, that's part of the action plan, and one of the things we've tried to, um, well, let me back up one step, is that a scope was put together, um, it was kind of patched together from a lot of other people's scopes of work for climate plan. And uh, it could have been, i say it could have been better, we tried to kind of modify it a bit, but there was some speed was a concern, it kind of went out the door, and the consultant pretty much just when you do it that way, well, if you don't do it right, they'll just spit back at you what you said is, yeah. is your job description and say, okay, we're going to do that. I'm going to do what you said, you know, and here's what it costs. <laughs> Without giving you a lot of confidence in how they're going to get, take all the steps and where they're going to get their information, what kind of analysis they're doing. So we ended up with a contract, uh, I think it was overall supposed to take like 16 months, 16, 18, we're pretty much on schedule. Um, you got to figure out, so like we said, whether you're focused on just town, and that was not adequate for us to just look at town operations, because no, be that's a drop in the bucket uh, yeah. for what the community is responsible for, for greenhouse gas. That's what you have the most control over, but it's, right, but it's, it's a drop in the bucket. Right, but businesses and residential and right. farms, yeah. And the town, the municipal government is, I don't know, 10% or something of yeah. what our, our generation, but we'll see it here. Um, you know, you, you figure out what the role of your committee is in the planning process and in working with a consultant. Um, we had a lot of input. We had some opportunities to talk with them and working meetings once a week or every, every couple weeks, actually. And we didn't always take advantage of it. Or there wasn't somebody always available. Luckily, we had the staff person, and I don't know if there's any but equivalent the, person. The planner? The, she was a conservation agent. Yeah, her name is Cassie yeah, Trager. Now she's leaving us to go to grad school for this subject in Germany and mm -hmm. we're going to be lost, <laughs> but nearly lost. So you're looking to hire another one though, right? Yes. They've got that. She wasn't really in the sustainability position, now they're advertising that. So you'll have the conservation agent and a sustainability we, person? We were hoping, yes. Yeah. And a, do you have a town planner also? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we don't have, well we have a conservation person. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the committee had a fair amount of say over what what the scope of the project was, timing issues, communication. One thing to decide early on also is to what extent it's a it's a public process and a participatory process. Um, you know, everybody automatically says that's what you got to do. You got to get people involved in the beginning, talk to everybody, get their views on stuff, um, synthesize that, and I think it's good. It's, it's good to get in the people who care about it, who will, who thought about this stuff and have some ideas and will have some energy and will then help you implement. But it's a pitfall of uh, 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 using them as just the, your, your gauge of the, mo the mood of the community and the thinking of the community. 
and we had a voluntary survey project, public survey project. a very thoughtful you know big survey and what the response rate wasn't so bad but it's to me it's it, it's uh, if you just put something up on the web and say go there uh, you're getting the choir you know you're you're not getting a good cross-section of the community. You get people who already care about it, or they really, maybe they really hate it, but there's, you know, there's not that many of those who are gonna go to the trouble. It's mostly people who really care. the extremes. So I think, but more of the supporters. And so you don't really have a sense of where you're standing, stand with the community, I think. Um, so I, I would argue for the money, some of the money spent on that elaborate survey process is to do something where like it's more scientific survey of re you know, representative survey phone or otherwise of members of the community to try to get a cross section of opinion about these subjects. That's that's my personal opinion. Um, the first step the 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 uh, consultant took, and you can mass uh, municipal get munis MMA mixed up with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council has a. Uh, has been very involved in climate plans with communities in the Boston area. area planning camps. It's it's our it's the equivalent of our Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for the Boston metropolitan area. They have people focused on this. They've done some a lot of good work with communities and, 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 and giving the communities tools to, to put together climate action plans. And, and one in particular is that they have a, a, a tool cell based tool or something for putting together your your greenhouse gas inventory for your for your community uh, and the consultant actually worked with that somewhat uh, it's not automatic you still have to go dig up data from the utility and from the government and from wherever taxes but not there, but you have a rough sense of the population when you stand in these days six thousand two hundred and eleven Oh, really? <laughs> really? Yeah, we work with those numbers all the time. Oh, I thought you guys were bigger than that. I thought you were much bigger than that. No. Because we we're at about 5,300. And we just make a lot of noise over there. And just, um, but it's growing. It's urban, huh? It's growing. Um, it's growing in popularity. And I, I'm yeah. trying to think, we got, some, we got our, 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 our uh, old schools that we've abandoned, the local schools right. are being converted for uh, affordable mostly affordable house, housing, right. yeah. <laughs> I, I wish one of them was kept for a resilience center, yeah. but um, anyway. We got all those warehouses. We're working on too. that too. Um, the warehouses that are becoming. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah. Condominium. Like okay, I drove by one today, and there's signs down here that say, Wouldn't you like to live here? And up above it, it's just trashed. Like all the windows <laughs> are broken. You're talking everything. about right down the pond next yes, to this works, yes. right? That's Ferry Street developments. Yeah, yeah they're the old. old Factories, uh, text, whatever yeah, they were putting the factories the out. Like, no. But yeah. they, they are cool. becoming like a high, high. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. I thought. Yeah. How yeah. awesome! Yeah, yeah. yeah that's not low. Back that's there. not it's low income. Shocking! Like yeah. four hundred thousand dollars for a, an apartment. Oh my god! Yeah. Exactly. So oh my god! Affordable house. There's some affordable, that are rentals, yeah. but yeah. so that's a that's a rough idea of the structure of our LEPS plan. So you, as a committee decide okay it's time we start working on this yeah and then what do you well, mayor's mayor was pushing in our, our city councils you know very so you went to them to talk about how to raise the money to hire the consultants kind of i think our mayor pretty much and whoever the treasurer and city council people finance committee whatever they they, they, were they came up with a plan they didn't have to we didn't have to do too much work on that okay they did they, they, they had some money stuff uh, Stash aside, I think our work with the Green Communities Program, I think, helped us bring in some money towards the plan. Well, so our Green Communities money, we'll talk about that later in our meeting, but it's more or less allocated to our elementary and our high school for um, weatherization, you know, for weatherization mm -hmm. yeah. and some things. We're not <coughs> pulling any of it back. You know, so far we're up like 140000 for what this committee has done and pulled in. So you're because, kind of tracking that, huh? Well, well that's we, we kind of have to just so people, you know, there'll be other people in the community who will, you know, push back on that. Like, what's the committee doing? It's kind of nice to have yeah. sort of a sure, scorecard. Sure, sure. It's not like it's we've raised one hundred forty thousand, and we have that cost the town. Right. Just turn the lights off and yeah, shut the AC off, and then you can tell me you're not costing us anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just kidding, but um, so. So the in inventory process, I mean, that's a pretty technical process and not always good, hard, easy to get your hands on. We, we were stuck on the waste end of it, although waste, 
as you oh, as I said, great. doesn't really great. add up to a very significant a few percent of your total in your city because you're not looking at upstream in so greenhouse gas impacts. It, it, we're like you, yeah. I think. Do most of your residents tell me? Do, do, do most of them use a transfer station, or most of them have private pickups? I see, it's most a mix. Have, no, most. If you look at the number of households, which is two thousand and something, the number of stickers sold last year was five hundred and fifty-three. So most people are yeah. higher in curves. And it's market. more. That's maybe more than we have a small transfer operation at our DPW. Um, we used to have a landfill closed, but nicely put solar. One of the first landfill solar farm in the country, I think, was mm -hmm. on our landfill. But um, the question is whether your board of health, or one question, it's not a big issue, but does your board of health have, as part of a, a requirement for haulers working in town, that they provide data on the number of accounts that they have and how much waste they collect and send to various facilities? If you don't, then you're guessing. You're 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 kind of in the dark about what your real, real recycling rate is. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like East Hampton. Like in East Hampton, well, it's called a washed hands approach, or, yep. or the yellow yellow pages approach. Let your fingers do the washing. That's so you right. find yep. solve your problems yourself. Go to the yellow page. Except that you do offer your transfer station. Right, but more that's people farmed out. We don't. Well, it's still available. Yeah, you, it's still available. To you. Yeah. Right. No. It's, anyway, it's we're good. relying a lot on the valley. Um, Oh, yeah. on, on Route 10, uh, and to supply. We have a lot of people in this town that use USA. Right, they're getting big, yeah. But so you don't really know what your proportion of what's generated. You don't really know what's generated in the town if you don't have those numbers. You can go by uh, uh, benchmark numbers that similar communities have. Um, you don't know what what you're generating. You don't even know where it's going, whether it's being recycled, and you know you're there. That's not so bad on the on greenhouse gases, or it's being landfilled or incinerated. So that's hard. Um, and, yeah, it, and our it consultants does. just had to kind of do some workarounds and look at benchmark numbers for other communities that do our our waste part. It seems like some of these numbers would be difficult for us to really um, get something reliable. I think anything else that we got. I, um, let, I'll, sh I'll skip forward and you can see this. Um, I can do this without going past it. I'll put it over inventory. And was this put together by Weston and yeah. Samson? Yeah. I mean, we've been looking at a lot of real out, you know, black and white outlines and no pictures and, and mm -hmm. unfinished stuff for months and, uh, and wondering what we're going to get in the end. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fairly pleased with them about Here's the here's the total um, breakdown uh, for the sectors in town for uh, both electricity and fossil fuel consumption. That's not greenhouse gases yet, but oops, sorry, that's what our consultant came up with. Okay, what well, that's amazing to have those kind of thinking. numbers. That I think we could get our hands. Well, you, you, uh, Matt, I mean, what do you have? Eversource or, or yeah, Eversource. Yeah. 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 They can get you that. Yeah. As They'll get your electricity. They'll get all the accounts. Interesting. You know, it's municipal, everything private business. Yeah, as far as I know, they'll do everything. Well, yeah. natural yeah. gas is. And, and they'll do, the, and they'll do gas. 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 But, you know, then you probably have guesswork about who's running oil furnaces in their homes because you don't have a lot of gas, right? You don't have a lot of gas connections in Hadley. No, we do have some. Oh, you do? Yeah. Well, a lot, com considering your population. Anyway, you got you know you'll be looking. It depends on what part of town. Like. You'll be looking for the oil. You know, yeah, the yeah. part you might be able. They might be able to talk with dealers. You know, the the, the oil deal, dealers, distributors, and find out some of that. I'm good. I'm in a meeting. Um, I'll call you back. So this is an overly complicated uh, pie chart about uh, by sector, by uh, whether it's electricity, fuel, oil, buildings, whatever. But there's more interesting stuff. I mean, here you see. That's an amazing chart. That's it's a little chart. too dense for. I mean, I if I had to, I'm used to this kind of stuff. I had to really stare at it for quite a while to penetrate it. It might not be great, so great for the, you know, general consumption. But so um, we could ask for it to be displayed a different way. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of options. I we looked at five or six other before we went no, too far. We looked at doing. five or six others. Uh, municipal climate action plans uh, 
Amherst, Northampton, Arlington, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah. Andover. Andover just was six months ahead of us with Weston and Sampson uh, in the process, so we could do that. Um, I don't like this breakout that they did. I mean, this is getting a little bit picky in detail, but you used to, be, you used to see, well, waste, and you'd see transportation, your sources of greenhouse gases. And then you'd see electricity sector, electricity, and then you'd see building heating, um, building heat, essentially. Right, this really gets into now, the heat a little bit. Now, the this, they, now they just call it, these guys like to call it stationary energy instead so, of transportation. So, so T and D is a... Transmission and distribution okay. losses, yeah. Gotcha. Um, it's it's good they did they did do some digging to uh, look at yeah, they, natural gas like distribution losses or as big as the over. solid waste alone. Isn't that right? Forty five, what was the waste? Forty nine. That's that's leaks, you know, that's gas leaks. And I don't know exactly how they came up with that number because they're not metering it. Um, but uh, so this is kind of what that stuff looks like. I think the RMB gives you figures about numbers of vehicles of different types, and then they probably take average mileage, you know, driven and average fuel efficiency to calculate what, what your vehicles are doing. So just to understand the process right, you didn't survey every resident, every business in town, you no. got it from the Eversource side. About electricity and gas, yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, did we end up with a comparison? with other towns. Um, there's three other towns that have plans in, and that the final product there is the met, uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalents per, per person. Um, and uh, you know, you see the variation and we're here. Mm. Uh, you know, just for, see what everybody else in the sandbox is doing, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're 16,026. Okay, so yeah. you're about three times half the size. Yeah. Okay. Plus, we could, well, I, I shouldn't say, do, I was going to say we have more interest, but we don't have more. We have more, we have probably more office and factory space, but you've got all the retail and commercial stuff, plus mm. the farms community. Yeah. That's, that's different. It's different than us. Anyway, I don't want to, you know, yeah. take you to a true page, but that's the inventory part. I should take you the probably the next part that's of most interest to you is, um, I mean, you get an inventory, you say, okay, this is what we do a year, all right? We have 25 years in our plan to get to to get to zero. Um, some places are looking to get to 90 percent or 95 percent because they don't, you know, on a statewide basis, they don't think we can get rid of every all the fossil fuels, and that we have to do is offset it with. Uh, Carbon uh, store sequ uh, carbon sequestration storage or carbon capture, um, but so you, this is where we get to, we want to get to. Um, so, what are the major in these different sectors? What are our priorities? Where are we going to get the biggest bang for the buck? And let's see if we can. And there's discussion about a lot of strat strategic stuff. Where's the part that just goes into do you have like an action plan yeah this is how it's structured um, it's different it's you know under buildings let's see is this buildings whatever doesn't matter it's just to get the general idea there's uh, there'll be a description uh, higher first step is higher sustainability court we'll skip that one uh, pursue climate leader community certification um, which is not too easy. Um, yeah, we we're, we're checking that. out the we're checking off the boxes right now. Um, adopting the uh, the opt-in specialized uh, building code, energy code, and um, and having a climate action plan. Uh, but uh, it, it is the reason for doing that was that it's supposed to open up the spigot on state yeah. money. Yeah. Um, I want to get into something that's not just hire more people and planners. Um, uh, okay, there's a talk about the specialized code. So it's what is it? You know what's involved? What you know? Yeah, we know, we looked into it. Yeah, and, but I'm just saying how it's structured. Uh, who's the lead? Eight, who's the lead department on it? Who we're supporting? Partners. You know, difficulties for implementation, hurdles for implementation, short, medium term, long term time frames co-benefits and considerations, things that are go beyond maybe just greenhouse gases or uh, help environmental justice communities or whatever. Costs, they haven't gotten to those yet. Oh no, that's their symbol and I don't like it. 
Uh, they have like four 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 dollar signs for expensive stuff and one dollar sign for. No, I mean, that doesn't tell you. No, I've had this What's kind of. In? I've had you know it's uh, it's understandably not an easy thing for them to project. Um, there's some things that are concrete and they could put numbers on, but, yeah, but it's really hard to. So you don't you know. Ideally, you want to know kind of bang for the buck for that you know what's even the most productive it ends up changing it still gives you something concrete right i agree that's the yeah. idea that's the idea so um specialized stretch code uh the actions are all numbered oh and then there's like th that part i'm not so familiar with this i'm not sure what that little chart was but it goes by in the different sectors all the actions. Here's one collaborate with the housing authority to identify energy efficiency and HVAC uh, retrofits. Uh, who's involved? Um, time frame, uh, sources of funding, how much cost? Housing authority, a fair housing. amount. Fair amount, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's the general structure. My, I mean, there's there's something like I don't know, 40 actions. You saw that one. This is one little mock-up for one. There's something like 40. I can't remember the number. It's there's quite a quite a few to get through. And uh, uh, so, is there something in here? I've noticed, like I get Lexington's monthly newsletter, mm -hmm. and I mean they're just. I mean, it's just so cool. It, it, you know, they have these like community. You know. You know, electrify Lexington, and you know they're doing all this different yeah. stuff, and it's very like, yeah, you yeah. know, like yeah. energizing, yeah. and yeah. here's all the incentives, mm -hmm. and you know, it, yeah. it kind of, it's just cool. It's yeah. a lot of really good information for residents, yeah. for as they're ready to like when they need a yeah. new furnace. Oh yeah, heat pumps. You know, it's like. So our our thought is, um, what are the what are the current incentives? How have residents and businesses been responding to incentives for solar, for heat pumps so far? You can get data from MassSave about yeah. MassSave will tell you how much uh, how much money was put into homes and businesses in the community and what the expected energy savings from that was. Um, you can project going forward what the incentives and changing incentives in solar and other things that are now happening might do to pull more people in and get more participation and how long you, how long it'll take you know over the years wise time wise to get nearly everybody on board um and is part of your plan really to do like a, a newsletter or some, yeah. something ongoing yeah. that goes out yeah. to businesses but and residents probably more more importantly i think we're interested in trying to train heat coaches in mm -hmm. uh, you know members some members of our own committee who, who know First of all, you know enough about home energy assessments um, to talk to people about you know where their losses are, what are they consuming, where are their losses, um, energy losses, and uh, you know. So what's, you what's guys ready go to people's homes and do like the something? idea is that we would be you know we're not the contractor, we're not the installer, but just kind of advisors and and co you know cheerleaders for people about you know and who we'll have good information. We'll go through a training. That's one thing that we're, a couple of us are looking at the committee's interested in doing so so who's doing the training with you there's a uh, there's different possibilities um, the one that comes to mind that's working in a bunch of towns right now it's called the heat smart alliance i was just talking with a guy the other day they have an online training kind of limited training then there was like a 10 session 10 week um, maybe a couple hours a night or something kind of training that they offered last spring that i just had on and probably in the fall but, um, so that that's what you know there's to, to get people residents and businesses who don't want to move on this or it's not their priority or can't afford it I mean that's one way to try to you know it's to handhold or to educate and to be out there and, and beating the drum and the other is looking at what are the state's projections for um, heat pump adoption EV adoption um, uh, home energy you know retrofit weatherization and retrofits over time how, you know what is their expectation about how many households will do that there's these cycles that people go through with replacing equipment and it doesn't make sense to 
to jump in on something, you've got a new boiler, you know, new right, gas boiler. Yet, so, so you look at the cycles. You it. look at the cycle. Yeah. Same with changing out your roof, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and stage, staging your solar. So you know, you look at what the state's projecting, and um, right now it's not looking great, from what I've seen um, for meet, meeting our solar targets uh, to get to 2000, to get to even the goal for 2030. We're, we're quite a bit behind, and uh, there's different theories about why that's happening, but ultimately, they may have to issue, they may have to offer more incentives. Well, it's also um, been that more than long bureaucratic process to get connect, connected. Connected. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if it's quite as bad for residents as it is for for big solar farms yeah. and utilities. It's, it's a pretty challenging process for residents. For anyone in this room who has solar or has recently redone solar, yeah. it's a lot. Whether you're working with Eversource or any other utility, but your contractor usually takes the lead. When I had solar put at my house, I didn't have to know about about the uh, connect interconnection permit and all the stuff you had to supply yeah. them and all that process. And but just the different steps in the process, yeah, is yeah. significant. Yeah, yeah. I mean. You have to want to do it, and uh, anyway, so this is so helpful to yeah. see. Yeah, and that's uh, you can see the investment in this. Oh, here's that we haven't talked too much about this: the solar voltaic ordinance about siting. Well, and municipal uh, aggregation. That was the committee municipal meeting. Municipal aggregation. There's this one here. Yeah, yeah that's have that that's, uh, yeah. that's, uh, that's moving great. forward with. I think we're finishing up the public input process now and it's going to go to DOER for review and well it was six, eight, six eight months ten months away it was interesting looking at the range of costs that Eversource charges I mean it was up to 20 cents per kilowatt in the winter down to 11 cents you know in the last six months it's amazing right. the range right 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 and that's with community aggregation you get at least for a couple of years at right. a time you get firm numbers you can right. you can plan on and not you know Get surprised in the middle of the winter. But, yeah. um, so, I mean, I think it's good to have the climate plan for a structure, you know, and to make you get get you focused again. Sometimes when you go off on tangents and get involved in a project and miss the forest for the trees, kind of thing, um, and to have know where your problems are, you know, where your where generation. Uh, greenhouse gas generation is the greatest and we're the most susceptible to uh, mitigating to get mm -hmm. you know to ending and uh, uh, it's far from a blueprint uh, there's one thing that our we realized toward the end of this process that the community uh, climate leader community designation requires you to have a roadmap, and this is a criticism I had of the plan halfway through it, and the scope is I never heard the consultant talking about. Okay, here's 40 actions. Um, tell us, you know, how many metric tons of carbon we're going to eliminate uh, by taking this action over time. They um, didn't determine. No. Um, they're working on something. I think That's it's. I think it's a little big. But I mean, if you don't know what those actions are going to, what mm -hmm. outcomes are going to come from those actions, or have a pretty good idea, mm -hmm. uh, you don't know how much emphasis to put on one versus the other. Yeah. And and you know even if you do all forty of them, if you you know if it's it's, it, you should know if it's you're going to fall sixty percent short doing all these actions. We're just not going to get there. So you start thinking about okay, maybe we have to go back to the drawing board and really think think about solutions that we haven't really considered yet um, some so, of that is state level so you know in just a few months we'll be five years away from the 2030 targets and I keep wondering are there any penalties that the state is looking at imposing on different communities that aren't hitting certain targets or 2050 targets and that's all care okay it's all care as far as I know I mean there's maybe it's in particular areas there might be um, I haven't seen any you know, like sort of. It's not like that. Uh, I mean, trying sticks, to but not it. not legal things yeah. or, or okay. fines. It it's more stuff. like it's not. This is what you have to do, or you're going to get in trouble. It's 
this is what we have to do so the planet doesn't overheat. It's just there's there, saying, there are a few things this to is say what we have to do, but not we're going to throw you in jail if you don't do it. There are a few things that the utilities are under mandates to increase the percentage of renewable energy mm -hmm. in their you know, the renewable energy portfolio. Um, so that's what one third of our generation greenhouse gases from the electric sector, electricity sector. So they're on a, but you know, they're also fighting and kicking along the way and it's not a, necessarily a done deal and I don't know what happens when they fail. What, I, I think there's financial penalties, but there's, um, um, what's the other one, was a couple others I was thinking of. The, I'm not so familiar with it, but the clean heat, uh, or heat smart, clean heat program has, there's been some recent legislation on that and DEP, I, I saw something in the paper about it and somebody worrying what they were going to do with this and it was putting, it's making installers of fossil fuel heating and cooling equipment um, reach certain targets for how much of what they, how much of their sales are clean energy mm -hmm. uh, sales and if they're not themselves able to put in uh, heat pumps themselves, there's going to be a, 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 a like a renewable energy credit, like a like the RECs they call it that that you'll get if you have a solar panel, and they they will buy they have to buy them if they can't actually be responsible for their customers they have to pay for those. And uh, it's an intricate system, and it, it's it's going to be controversial, but it's a way of getting at putting some teeth into making that move forward. Is and the state offering training for people to learn how to put in heat pumps that are used to putting in the like general oil public? Oh, oh, that's a. So I know for for like the building code upgrade, there's all kinds of classes and stuff. Yeah, <coughs> and I hear that's not working so well for right. people, the, for the contractors, but um, I don't think this, I, I think they're, they've got their hands in that, but I'm not aware of any direct to the citizen training right yet. Uh -huh. it's, it's more about people just supporting, supporting technical schools and vocational schools for training electricians and uh, in renewable energy stuff. That's more, more what I see. Um, so, um, anyway, but finally for us, the, a lot of things are kind of um, blossoming at the same time. We're kind of in limbo for a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, I actually focused when I first got on the committee on electric school buses and, and uh, with the limitation that we don't own our own bus system and we use Durham to Right. What do you do here? Yeah, we farm it. Is it five also, star? Not, yeah, you have. You don't have. Turn I think that's the name. It yeah, was five star. That's Amherst. Same, yeah. same, same company. I think Amherst, maybe. Yeah, possibly. Um, and you know, we had to go through a process of getting through the mayor, getting support, get talking to a school committee because we can't decide what's going to happen with the school bus system. Yeah. We're not in a good position because we don't own our own buses. You can work with your contractor as Holyoke has just done, I think Amherst is also. They got Amherst. Amherst. They got their own, but Holyoke's working with Durham. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's just, finally we got the school committee new, newly elected to jump on, on board with this and we want to work with regional, regionally with other school districts who use Durham because you don't get grants very easily as a small community that's not uh, predominantly environmental justice community. That's where the focus right. is grant money. Um, anyway, so that's moving. The municipal aggregation is on its way, you know, for approval. We got the, the energy code, special opt-in code adopted. The climate plan's coming in. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff's finally, it was kind of all on the back burner in limbo, and in the course of a couple of months, it's just kind of all gelling. Um, not, that, well, not that we've solved any problems, but we're getting the tools. Yeah, yeah, tools. no, you're getting but the stuff in place. Yeah. Uh, again, I'll repeat, in going to that municipal aggregation meeting, your mayor is so supportive of all yeah. these initiatives yeah. well, and yeah. that really yeah. helps drive them forward. Yeah, we just need to have that one person and you'll yeah. have a select board and other departments mm -hmm. you've got to, how many, how many members are there? Select board five or three? Or no. you're, you're on the select board? Five. Five, five. okay, so you've got five people you have to get 
get on early schedule. And the joint yeah. administrator. Yeah. Yeah. Is that full time administrator? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's the plan stuff. There's other things, you know, um, Jack and I have talked about, and he knows I'm involved that we could talk about sometime, but that's a lot we've already spent. Yeah, 45, it, it, this was very helpful for mm -hmm. us to see how you started and began driving through a plan like this. What else? I mean, a lot of it's taken up by this. Uh, so in your plan, does it divide it up like oh, that's the transportation, other. buildings? It's, like I was saying, it's transportation and stationary. I just don't like yeah. it. It should be transportation, building building electricity, building heat, you know, and right. waste, yeah. it, waste is. Right. Waste is almost a waste. It's such a tiny fraction of uh, it's good to have people conscious. Do you that. include your water treatment plant? In that? Yes, yes. I always forget that because I've been in solid waste my whole life, but you know, I forget <laughs> about wastewater. <laughs> you know. Well, because they're so expensive to operate. Yeah. The other thing the town was doing before, when I got on board, they had what do you call them? An energy services, an ESCO contract with uh, Honeywell to do like what UMass did. I mean, they, they, commission, they, they commission projects and guarantee savings. Um, I'm trying to think if they, I'm forgetting now whether they put up money on their own and an expectation of the savings coming back to the ESCO, mm -hmm. to the company, but there was a whole citywide plan um, done. And because of the federal legislation, federal, um, IRA and uh, uh, and uh, the infrastructure law, they put it on hold to see what was going to happen because that was going to you know, figure out where the funding was going to come to wastewater treatment plant, the water system, uh, the BW operations. The other thing you have to figure out is is are you talking about just climate mitigation plan or climate adaptation and. We asked them to, to kind of review our climate adaptation status and prospects and whatever because, but not spend a lot of that, put a lot of emphasis on this because we had had done some mitigation work done under some other state grants in, in recent years. Yes. Yeah, most, yes. Yeah, we yeah. have one. So we have something there to work with. Um, and you can just kind of bring that into the climate action plan, right? I guess they kind of exist in parallel. I mean, they're almost two different worlds, yeah. you know? Some towns combine theirs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, there's no reason you couldn't, but operationally, what you do to add, add, you know your adaptation stuff is well, you can get them off of the different MVP focus then. Yeah. yeah. So, other committee members, any other questions for John before he heads back to East Hampton? That was very helpful, and I, and I just wanted to also thank you for your editorial, your recent editorial. Yes. Just so exciting. I thought it was. Very well written. Very Thank sensible. you. Very Thank you. Uh, I'm kind of going out on a limb there. It's not a very no, popular, it's, popular it's perspective. It, it, actually, it puts it in the a right lot of the to scan on that. Room. Yeah. I'm not so sure how I feel about. I think farms are different. You're a farmer. I have farms are a different story than than forest. I mean, solar produces a lot. Compensates by a factor of five or ten for the the carbon storage you lose when you take down forest, and over time it's it gives you five to ten times the mitigation of carbon that you're no more gas, no, you know, replacing fossil fuels. But Farming yeah. is you know food self reliance is another value, and you could do agrivoltaics to a certain extent. I guess it's being tested, but I can see people's hesitancy more about especially this valuable farmland that we have in the valley about covering well, it up with solar panels. The thing about it is that putting solar on farm, not that I'm so gung-ho about putting solar on farm, but at least it doesn't ruin it. Like you could take the solar away after right. a certain and Nobody's time. Nobody's planning on putting solar on, on prime at least six Yeah. Months. Okay, good. No. Yeah. Well, and yeah. also this is a topic. Because it's too valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As farm. Yeah. This is a topic that passed the Senate, and it's heading toward the legislature. Right. You know, right. the House. And we'll see what happens at the right. state level, because this is so far above a town committee. Mm -hmm. This is, this what, is happening solar state siding? No, no, the siting issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we've got to get moving on it. I, I mean, think, I think this last legislative proposal dropped 
they were trying to eliminate the 1985 statute that said so-called the order amendment or something. Right. Like that. They're not trying to get. They, they didn't drop that from what I most recently read, which is a bit of a relief because I think a lot of people were trying to get rid of that. But they're putting their their they're enabling some. They're redefining what's with the legislation and the siting standards. What's an acceptable way to restrict and govern and and site solar with all kinds of siting criteria and standards and processes there. So they're not getting rid of that, but they are going to make it a more rational process that has that has to meet some basic environmental standards around the state and provide protections for. But the communities, unless it's uh, over over 25 megawatts facilities, um, communities will still be reviewing those those permit applications. Uh, under the Senate version, um, but they're going to be doing it with a standard, with a uh, what do you call it? A uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? A standard form, a standard form as a standard set of criteria that you can't say one thing in this town and the next well, thing in right. the other town See, and try to extort that's four acres for every standard. acre. Of, it really right. kind of is. Right. Otherwise, wait, right. over 25 over megawatts. 25 megawatts goes to the state's <coughs> energy siting facility board under that law for them to make a decision. They will still take input from communities, but it's up to them. Under 25 megawatts. That really means, unless that's things really system. change, that's yeah. that's everything, almost everything we've seen so far yeah. developed in that's 25 huge, years yeah. is less than 25 minutes. Right. So it's still going to come to the communities. It's just supposed to be a consolidated permit. Uh, you don't have to go to eight different boards. Whether the boards all meet together or they create a committee that is responsible to put it all, I don't know how that part works, but one, one single permit, not six or seven or four, and a set of uh, siting sta standards and review criteria that, that everybody's got to work with. Well, and they're saying that the whole process would get done in a year instead of this five, six, seven. They're years. setting a limit on it, whether it happens and what the penalties are if it doesn't, but yeah, supposedly it'll go, it, it, it shifts to the, the state if you don't get it done. Hmm. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting. I don't know what the house is going to do. Supposedly, it's any minute, any day, the house is supposed to, you know, figure out how they are responding to the Senate's proposal. But well, they have 20 days left in yeah. this term. That's yeah. it. Right. Anyway, um, it's interesting. But I, I I I think it would be good. I've kind of right from the beginning on my committee felt like it'd be good for us to be having regular interaction with um, our neighboring towns committees you know see what you know cross pollinate you know see Absolutely. what's going on we did that you did this how did that go uh, some things you can't you know you'll have more clout if you approach legislative people or the state or whatever um, as a coalition of communities or rather than right. one at a time so there yeah. could be some value in that and I'll talk to our committee about whether they want to propose some kind of you know just like you did, you came in and sat on our municipal aggregation thing. You know, well, and I came you, here. You know. you know, if I wasn't actively looking for more information about the siting projects and all of this, because we've gotten prompted from public comments a couple months ago, I wouldn't have found you. So it was really good yeah. to track you down yeah. and to have these cross pollination. Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You too. Uh, interesting. Thanks. And good luck. And we'll be in touch. Thank, right. thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right. Updates. The Conservation Commission session that Kathy and Jack went to. Kathy, you were going to tell us about that. Yeah, you're going to have to forgive me because when I went to the meeting, I didn't realize I would be making a report. So I'm well, a let's do the sketchy. Yeah. So Jack and Bill yeah, and we'll yeah. do um, uh, The presenter, Mark Stinson, from Mass DEP and Division of Wetlands, did the primary, well, one of two primary presentations. Um, and these things struck me from his presentation that according to Massachusetts, all drainage ditches are streams. So everything falls According to the wetlands protection. And okay. Yes. So everything is a stream. And then we have the agricultural exemption to that, which allows them what we call ditches um, for farms to drain 
their land. Um, and the definition of an agricultural farm as opposed to a garden, um, farming is for the commercial purposes, land is in production, there are maybe auxiliary buildings, farms, sheds, access roads, hedge roads, wind breaks. So it's an active farming situation that um, is permitted the exemption to the Wetlands Act. Okay. Uh, let's see. And as long as the farm is in production, the um, exemption is allowed. If the farm stops producing or the land that the ditch is on stops production for five years, it loses the exemption and would have to have a repermitting process. Um, and apparently they do check. They use the GIS Google Earth system and I guess check on the production of farmland. So it's part of their data collection. Uh, let's see. And I think, help me out here, Jack, if I mess this up. So this does not mean if there is no drainage ditch and a landowner, particularly farmer, feels there needs to be one, they can go through a permitting process. And dig one. To, they need to dig one. Right. Um, let's see. And I didn't catch a lot of this. Agricultural solar installation is not exempt from wetland regulations unless all of the energy is going to use on the farm. So whatever energy produced from the solar array has to be utilized on the farm itself. Okay. So it can't be larger than what's needed on the farm to be exempt from wetlands protection. And then the second person was Manuel Diaz Gonzalez, who was a civil engineer. And he kind of talked about the process of putting in drainage ditches. On farms or d anywhere? On, on farms. farms. He focused yeah. on farms. So this whole thing it was, was mostly farms. All agriculture. It was really, that was the audience, that was the intent of the yeah. session. And what um, Manuel Gonzalez said is it's really very complicated because you can only drain 100 feet in either yeah. direction. What? The ditches the don't ditches. drain as much as one would think. Right. To, yeah, so they right. estimate that most ditches will drain about a hundred feet in either direction. If you look at a lot of the Hadley farmland, you will find wet spots, dry, dry spots them. right next to each other. Yeah. So it makes it really complicated. The other thing, and I'm going to add this, flat. exactly, yeah. and there's really no it's slow. To, yeah. So our DPW director was there and he left the meeting very frustrated because you can if Kathy has a farm in between and Michael and I are not farmers, you can keep your area clean. But because we are not farmers... You're not allowed to touch it. Right. right. So it's just thing. really complicated with all of this. So it sounds to me like we need to get Joe Comfort in here. Wait a minute. She's not allowed to dig out our ditch? No, no, no. If, you, we, if you, we give her permission... No. They weren't going there. No, they were not going there. Right. 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 Non-agricultural yeah. land, you can't. But do it's it. for her agricultural purpose. Good, good question. Mark Stinson <laughs> was very yeah. precise in saying, "No, no, all you're all you're able to do is just farmer Kathy can yeah. keep her ditch going, and you don't have the right non-farmers to jump in." She can um, go 100 feet into our land, and that's it. Well, and whatever. Not even a hundred no. feet. It's just the the fire the ditches drain a hundred feet on each side. That's where that number came from. Okay. But it was just very complicated because Scott is saying, "Now what do I do? How can right, I there's no, extend the drain?" No laws There are no no laws giving any kind of permission for drainage on non agricultural land. Correct, because of the definition of stream and the wetlands protection. Right. Yeah. And, and they were really adamant about that and really precise in saying that, that, you know, you can't dig on somebody else's land and that left him supremely frustrated. No, but what about people who they have, you know, it's like my daughter lives on Crystal Lane, you know, and they're like these ditches, I mean, whatever you want to call it, a ditch, a stream, a gully, 
on either side of their house and there are trees and stuff growing in there but it's obvious it's there for drainage is she a farmer no okay so they can't touch that right that's what he walked away telling us and there whether was there's something growing in it or not you still yeah as just a regular homeowner and, and there, the meeting was held over there and mm. how many people would you ask me good room full I think mean, yeah of, I didn't count but I mean you probably more than 50 drainage ditches yeah I mean that this sounds completely ridiculous absolutely I mean, I mean, for a function. and there were a lot of farmers who left that meeting really frustrated mm -hmm. because that's not what they need to hear well that's why I feel like but I mean even if you if you had the land the other landowners permission and agricultural entities are exempt it seems like that that's subject to legal interpretation. Well, that's and why I feel like we need to talk to somebody about this because it just sounds like there just aren't any laws for addressing this issue. It, there aren't any laws. That's so once the legislative session ends, this would be a great phone call to Joe Comerford mm -hmm. and just say, can you make this so it can happen? Rather than being At blocked least out, land with with a budding landowner with uh, approval. Right. Yeah. I have a question. Please. Can anyone clarify what is important to have in the ditch, and as a climate change, what is what what, what why are we affected? Talking well, about, yeah. well Manuel was talking about all different designs, but basically, you know, it's sort of you know, a V-shape in the ground. He's no, even showed us. No, you mean why? Why are we talking important? about it as a climate change committee? No, no, but what is the importance of the ditch? To mitigate the, the water, water to the yeah. So farmers can't mitigate. farm because otherwise the water backs up and they can't farm. And, and about carbon, about climate change, what it's to make the land hazard mitigation issue. Mm -hmm. right. Right. It's to this make the land it. tillable. It's to keep it growing. You know, if you have two inches of rainfall tomorrow night, okay, That's all of a sudden idea. you're yeah. you're halfway through your growing season and you lose your crop okay. because, it's like, it's like because the water the can't move yeah. and it will flood. Right. So, so climate reduced. change, we are seeing the uh, the, sto the water that is damaging. Absolutely. Okay, right. That's why we need to know. Absolutely. And yeah, for everybody else that wanted to, why we, are we talking and why are we worrying yeah. about so much of that? If you look at the last four or five years, yeah. above average water, it, it's been three years. I don't know. I have to go back and check the fact. But it's it's been higher than average over these last yeah, few yeah. years. Okay. And this has been a significant yeah. problem. Yeah. Devastating. So, but right. speaking to a private property, or non-agricultural property. There is the thing about replacing the culverts, though. We can uh, maintain... Yeah, well, now, Mark didn't something. really, I mean... I think some people ask right people some, people ask some culvert questions, but you know, I think it's interesting that this week's Boston Sunday Globe, one at the center of the fold, Climate woes flowing downstream, many culverts, bridges won't be able to under, uh, withstand intensifying storms. Right, because they're too um, Because this is such a significant issue that the exactly. whole, know. The, all the dominoes of the drainage system are really set up for this. Right, so just like uh, it's on the um, town website, it, you know, the work the DPW did do where they replaced culverts and stuff, mm -hmm. and that was on non-agricultural land. Ooh. It it was along. I think they're allowed to maintain streams along or drainage ditches along mm -hmm. highways. Or main well, highways. the big culvert on Knightley Road right. drains agricultural land, right. Right. but it's well, not on. They, they didn't phrase it as an agricultural usage. They phrase it as we're going to fix this damn color because it's a mess. Right. And so they that's what we need rule. We just need better rules, I think, that address yeah. all of our drainage situations, not just on farms. So, uh, you know, I believe that turning to a Joe Comerford, you know, a senator, Dan Carey, but he's going to be leaving office in the fall. I think getting the word out to them to see what they can do at the state level. This isn't just 
Hadley's problem. This oh, isn't right, just right. Amherst's yeah, yeah. problem or Sunderland. This is all We're having the, the same problem in Deerfield right. and Sunderland. Absolutely, and Deerfield spent millions trying to clean up the mess from this mm -hmm. between culvert problems and agricultural mm -hmm. drainage. Mm -hmm. So this is so this awesome. is a big issue, and this was one of the biggest issues that they talked about at the Farmers Day mm -hmm. that we co-sponsored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do we want to wait a little while, and then? Oh, well, I think we have to wait at least until the end of the month. Okay. Because they're just straight out and want in the state house. Get in touch with them. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Next, Michael Solar. Um. <coughs> Update on the landfill, um, solar project. I'm not sure where we were a month ago, but I believe we were proposing and the select board decided to uh, pay for pre-application to Eversource. And what we've learned in the interim period is that Eversource has changed their pre-application process and put it online and made it free. Basically, oh, oh, wow. Wow. or greatly reduced in expense, <coughs> and you could just go online and see. Oh, it looks like the system's jammed up, and you're, you're going to need a lot of inner, a lot of great improvements in order to put a big solar system in heaven, which is what we knew all along. Um, <coughs> um, so, what in order to actually go forward, the actual step. Well, wait a minute. So you can do the pre-app online, and then will they give? What will come back to us is the exact basically information. Basically, just um, there's not enough capacity right now for, for a large system. So, will they tell us what needs to happen? In order to do that, yeah, we need to submit an actual application. Okay. okay for for a project, and that's slightly more involved than the pre-application was, um, and and we do need a another solar expert or installer to do that process. Um, solar Design Associates has has most recently given the town an estimate of, of $5,000 to, to do that engineering work for oh, the town, okay. basically. Um, well, so that's been approved? No. Okay. No. The select board is going to meet on Wednesday gotcha. and discuss this right. um, as to whether they want to proceed with hiring them to do this application. Who's going to talk about that? Um, uh, the town administrator has appointed David Phil to be the, lays the select board liaison for this project at this point, which is great because he's excited about it. He was the one who came up with the idea originally, yeah. years ago, um, to put solar on a landfill. Um, and so I've been communicating with him a little bit. He got Molly Keegan to put it on the agenda uh -huh. for, for Wednesday. And um, we're going to, you know. So he'll be explaining the process. Yeah, Wednesday. and I'll be helping. I, 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 I can't go to that meeting, but I'll attend remotely. He's asked me to kind of be there for the yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah, that's Thanks so for sharing that history. I didn't realize he was the one who originally came up yeah, with that idea. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's moving along, um, and um, so it's five thousand dollars. Just to be clear, it's five thousand dollars for their fee for the engineering. I think I think it's a, forgive me. It's about fifteen thousand dollars total um, to do that to do it because there's a, there is an a substantial application fee as well. And just I, to I, apply. I'll have those numbers. Yeah, at my fingertips by one. So that's thing. no actual work. It's just the whole figuring out. No, you're not. You're not even doing any digging at this point. We're a long just way figuring out what has digging. to happen. So at what? The what? What that will do is it'll it'll put a proposal in there. We will get in the queue. Most importantly, which will lock in our place in line with all these other large scale solar developments that are there. Yeah, which has advantages to it um, to, to be like in the queue basically because what the what the uh, utility company may do is say well you know we've got five big four big solar projects in Hadley being proposed right now it's going to require a fair amount of grid infrastructure improvements um, we need to study it um, we're going to all all the all five of these participants are going to have to come up with some money to study it and that's going to cost some real money by that time I think we can probably raise some grant money um, to to pay for that part of it uh -huh. um, should that eventuality happen. We have some time to kind of do that in, 
get ready for that if that happens. So what kind of time frame do you think we're talking about? Like a couple of years? To get it built a couple of years. Oh, to get it built. Like yeah, a couple get, years to get years. through that. The, 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 the pre-application I don't think takes very, I'm sorry, the application doesn't take very long. I, I imagine every source is going to take forever, a year or whatever. To figure out years. what yeah, upgrades. Yeah, to figure out whether they, what they yeah, that's what I was figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it, what's really important is to get, get the ball get just line. moving yeah. and get in line. Okay, well, so good. speaking of balls moving, can you um, share a little bit more about the senior center? Do you have any insights? Yeah. Um, there's been one solar installer has put a proposal in for putting solar on the roof here, and um, we've asked two other installers for proposals as well. We're waiting to hear from them. We're asking them for two types of proposals. One is um, a certain number of, of kilowatts on the roof. I forget what that number, number is. Um, and we're asking people to bid on that, that number because that seems like, like you know, what covering the north side, side the uh, yeah. south side, and, and you know, using yeah. the easily available roof space. Um, comes out to X kilowatts. Yeah. Forgive me for not, I, I, I've been busy. You did. Uh, 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 but anyway, yeah. so, for, and, and so that's proposal one, is what is, what is it going to cost you installer to, to put this size system together? And then there's a second request that we're asking them, which is to use their brain power a little bit, look at this complicated roof structure, see if there's some other places on the roof in addition to the obvious southern exposure that would make sense to stick some panels up there since they've got a like crew already on the, maybe on the west side. Exactly. Yeah. Since okay. they've already got a crew there and the scaffolding's there and the system's there. And the money to pay for it too, right? And what is and, and so what we're asking in that second proposal is what is your creation for a design for this particular roof and we're gonna evaluate that on the the best the, the highest number of kilowatts per dollar invested for, for the project basically. And so that so that we'll have we'll, ideally we have two sets of proposals from a couple different installers and we can look at them. So that we're just in the process of that. Yeah. Well, thank, you thank you for doing this yeah. because this solar stuff is so yeah. complicated. It, it is, but there's a lot of people who are smart out there and can just ask some questions. <laughs> That's all and, I need. Yeah, why, we sorry, need you to know what questions to ask. So it's called why only two companies applying for that? Being so many solar companies. Why only a few? Yeah. Why only two? Why only one? Why? Um, well, because it's really complicated, and we're trying to. I mean, w we can send it out beyond that if we want to, mm -hmm. but these are the reputable companies in mm -hmm. town that that you know that that you know that that have done a lot of work in Hadley, mm -hmm. residential work in the valley. Um, we if you have another installer that you want me to send it to, I'm happy to do that if anybody does. In so who are we so far? Um, Northeast Valley? Is it PV squared? PV squared. And the Northeast Solar? Northeast Solar and I think... I don't know the third. The third one. Um, valley Solar? I think it's Valley Solar. Think it's valley solar. <laughs> um, but if other people have, you know, other installers they've got good you know histories with that's fine these are all some of the more reputable installers in town um, you know it gets complicated because everybody proposes a different panel and you know mm. if, you, if it's somebody who you don't really trust they could come up with some really cheap panel that they're going to throw up and yes. so you, you want to kind of you know stick know, with people know that you're dealing yeah. with and how about Tesla what's going on with them Tesla yeah um, I think they're doing great. No, no, but why? Is it because of corporation or what? Like, we ask, we ask them. Okay, well, yes, them to do it. They don't install solar, to my knowledge. They build electric vehicles, right? No, well, they, they do solar. Well, they make panels, but I don't think they there's. Do. They make panels and batteries. But they I'm not sure good. if they're actually doing installation in the valley they anymore. Do. They used to. But I think they. You, yeah, I just received a proposal yeah. from them about you like that. From yeah. Tesla? Yeah. Huh? For I mean, batteries or for Tesla. For batteries or for solar panels? Solar. Are we talking about batteries or solar? Talking about solar. 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 Both. solar. Yeah. yeah, solar. They do. Well, we could send them a bit. I doubt that they would 
entertain it, but we could. She's saying she just got a proposal. No, I, okay. I, 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 I'm like, that's why it's why you only. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so I can send it to yeah. you and then. That's a good question. Um, anyways, so that's yeah, all yeah. I know at this point. Okay. Thank, thank you. So next is um, where we stand at the elementary school in Hopkins. And I can speak to that. Yeah. Chris Stager in, he's the business manager for the Hadley Public Schools. He's been out on break um, lately. He has one bid for 41000 uh, that he's trying to move forward and again our grant for the green communities would cover that is that for windows or uh, um, weatherization around no, it, it's, it, I believe that's oh, the that's one that re roof to re -talking the windows I think that's the okay. one that he's talking about so when he's back in action um, but we have the last email in to him to say where are things at so and also yeah. talk to me yes yeah. paperwork yeah okay. all right I think that's well we're and climate action plans has anybody looked into any other ones besides East Hampton? well East Hampton was my community right. and to go with John and it was interesting because I couldn't call up what he was able to show today I'm glad to take a look um, it's extremely complex yeah with all of this right so but we can yeah. take our time on that so Kathy, you haven't really dug into. I looked I looked at Northampton's uh, Reddit over in its entirety, um, and it's a lot. It's it's impressive as all the others are. Um, clearly, a lot of people put a lot of time and energy into it, and clearly money was spent. Yeah, in putting this together. This was not a one man or one commission oh, no. at no. all. In fact, um, they said six hundred and fifty. Over 650 people participated wow. in the generation. Well, because they had a lot of focus groups they had, and yes, um, workshops, community workshops. Here so, here. Mm -hmm. um, as yeah. John was talking about buying from the community, yeah, they they looked at all the stakeholders. You know, they really worked getting all the stakeholders involved. Uh, the project was funded by a grant. There was, I can't tell if there's three consultant teams, but. Linnean Solutions, Kim Lundgren Associates, and Fuss and O'Neill were mentioned as part of it, so I think they all contributed um, to pieces and parts. Uh, let's see, in this process, they worked on it for a while, because I think whatever the initial stages were began in 2008, because that number is on the website, and then their action plan was done, completed in 2021, and I believe they have a 23 update right. on their website. Uh, and what um, Northampton basically did is they took the lead rating system um, and used the criteria from that to, to create the structure of their program. So they had categories of energy, which were broken into sources, building use and carbon sequestration, water, they broke into stormwater management and water supply. Because uh, they have, they call them pathways, I think, or something. There's That's like part of the, yes. Like five. The yes. action plan is embedded in a resilience and regeneration plan. So it's right. part of a whole bigger structure. The lead is basically a scorecard, you know. That's one way that you can analyze the success of a yeah, building. Yeah, again, it's, yeah. A, it's a group of norms or something set up. Like a rubric. Yeah. Um, and waste, they had waste reduction, mm -hmm. transportation, land use, um, low carbon and equitable transportation, and then efficient land use, and then a, a category of equity, uh, and then a category of health and safety. Again, land use, such as established cooling centers, things like that in hazard mitigation I thought it was really neat to read um, but yeah what a project yeah <laughs> well thank you impressive much. so I mean what does Hadley do maybe it would benefit us to find other smaller towns locally yeah and we work together and hire a company if it's allowed hire maybe. consultants together and maybe that's something Mimi would know 
if it's I allowed. Allowed. I don't it, is, it is allowed. Uh, Bedford and um, Lynn, I think. No, not Bedford. Um, two towns in the east did it. Revere. Revere and Beverly. I don't know. And, and it's really interesting because after you read through, you really see, as John was trying, was articulating very well, that you have this all on paper. Now it's your guide. You can right. check yourself right. and see right. the progress you're making. Well, it's basically it's look at how much greenhouse gas are we generating and where, mm -hmm. and then how much do we need to reduce it and how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, but right. even more. Yeah, like yeah. looking at storm. I mean, we're talking well, about then the there's the whole yeah, hazard that's mitigation. That's a priority yeah. for yeah. us. Yeah. 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 So all of these parts, I think, are equally important. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks for that review. It's always important to hear what other towns are doing. And, you know, I wonder about the Sunderlands and the Grandbys and some of our similar. Well, I've looked at towns. them, and they don't, they don't have climate action yeah. plans either. They have hazard mitigation plans. Like, almost everybody has that, including us. But um, mm -hmm. a lot of the little towns don't have a climate action plan. And either. the hazard plans might be a state requirement at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think they might be. It sounds like they might be. Yeah. But there are, there are uh, you know, even though, I mean, what we may end up having to do is look at s whatever smaller towns do have climate action plans, even if their scenario is much different than ours. Like maybe they're in the east part of the state or something, but it still might be helpful to look mm -hmm. at not so much the, the little bits of what they're doing, but just the, I'm interested in the template. like. The steps you need to take to develop I kind the thing. Looking at East Hamptons, North Hamptons, and I think I took a peek at the other couple of towns from the east, the templates are really very similar. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure template is the problem. I think getting bodies of people together. Well, and getting trustworthy information. Yes. And yeah. you're talking yes. about greenhouse gases. Well, right. the carbon dioxide from here is now over there. You know, everything is moving. Right. Well, and I think, like John said, he wasn't too impressed with what their consultant, and maybe that's something we need to look at too, like who did different towns use and mm -hmm. how do we like the way their plan looks. Right. Right. And yeah. But he said that he initially was not impressed, but as soon as he saw the and that's product you want. Yeah, but if you look if you look at the way they set up oh, okay. the actions Oh yeah that that's part compared yes. to how right. Northampton yeah, yeah. does it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I totally got it. Yeah. I got it, yes. Yeah. Like that yeah. Northampton's is so much more readable and understandable. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So I don't know, I just think it pays mm -hmm. the Well East Camp had an interesting model. You know, these are things that we learn along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're running out of time and we do yep. public comment. Okay, public comment. Hey, you guys have anything to say? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, during the last meeting on June 16th, a disturbing video was shown regarding global warming and Guatemalans living in squalor. Uh, I'd never seen anything like that. Uh, June 13th to 15th, days before, was the G7 conference in Apulia, Italy where seven people flew in on seven private jets. Uh, maybe they had their private chef or someone to carry their bags, so more than one passenger per plane, uh, but you get what I'm saying. They're eating lobster and caviar and have no worries about their carbon footprint or fossil fuel usage. They talk about it and tell you what to do, but it's do as I say, not as I do. These actions make me skeptical and question who's benefiting from these extreme climate programs to save the planet. You are probably aware that the Labour Party in the UK recently won and they are scaling back their ambitious climate program to curb climate change as the country is broke. The climate program is too costly and people can't afford it. President Biden met with Vladimir Putin after the Afghanistan withdrawal in 2021 and lifted sanctions on Nord Stream 1 and asked nothing in return from him. 
The Nord Stream Pipeline is a network of offshore natural gas pipelines that run under the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany. It comprises two separate projects, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Combined, they have the capacity to transport a total of 55 billion cubic meters of gas a year to businesses and households in the EU for at least 50 years. The pipelines are the most direct connection between the vast gas reserves in Russia and energy markets in the European Union. They are majority owned by Russia's state-run energy giant Gazprom and again are used to transport natural gas from Russia to Europe under the Baltic Sea to their terminal in Germany. President Biden was angry when the pipeline was sabotaged in 2022. Yet the president canceled the Keystone XL oil pipeline from Canada to the U.S., citing the need to combat climate change. These are mixed signals. Many do not want to drive electric vehicles, want to drive a vehicle of choice such as a hybrid, yet EVs are being mandated in upcoming years. I've read that one in five charging stations do not work and EVs actually malfunction in thunderstorms. The efficiency and storage of EV batteries is still uncertain and under scrutiny. It is my personal belief that the war on energy in the U.S. has fueled inflation and that extreme climate change ideology will bankrupt people. They don't want it. They can't afford it. I'm not saying there is no climate change, as yes, the climate is always changing. What I am suggesting is that you pause on any extreme moves and be cautious when creating your climate action plan in Hadley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my comment would be uh, just a couple quick comments. I, I, did, uh, I, I did look at the East Hampton action plan. It is available online. One, one, uh, one thing that, that struck me, and I was kind of surprised to hear that it's a $150,000 plan. It doesn't have any costs in there. And I know there was some, uh, th there was some TBD costs, and there was a whole section on costs. There are no numbers. You, you can't, if, if you have a plan, and if Hadley does move forward with a plan, don't develop a plan with no costs in it. Because yeah, okay. you, you want to have costs and, uh, costs and benefits. You want to be able to s say, this is what it's going to cost us, and th these are the consequences of it. And, and um, you know, it, th they're at a dis we're all at a disadvantage because we don't know. And as the Energy Commission, uh, Climate Commissioner Melissa Hoffer uh, from Massachusetts said in October, we, we don't, we've don't we never done an analysis, a comprehensive analysis of the economic impact of all of these things that we want to do. It's striking that we've gone this far and we're spending billions of dollars without really knowing what it's going to cost. Seems like that should have been done first, but here we are. We're, we're, we're at, uh, we do know, and, and Melissa Hoffer mentioned this in, in the October report, that the nationally the estimated cost is between 25 and 30 trillion dollars to get there by 2050 for nationally that's a lot of money and that, that's not really it's not really viable we're not we, we don't have that kind of money but the, that, that would be more than a trillion dollars a year so I think we really need to get a, a hard look at these costs what what are what is this actually going to do how, how, how are we going to get there as, as Susan was saying, you know, we, we ha need to look at this from our, take a really hard look at it. What is this, what is this going, is that even possible? It's not, I don't think it's possible to, to, to spend 25 to 30 trillion. Um, you know, we do print money in this country, but that's a lot of money even for us with inflation going, um, going nuts. And so um, even, my, my last comment is, we're spending that kind of money, even, even the inflation, um, um, it was called the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a climate act. That's been so devalued by, because of inflation itself. That, 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 um, it, it's a fraction of what it, what it originally was valued at. Because of inflation, it's, it's damaged that. So uh, costs need, need, to be, need to be looked at in whatever we do. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Alex, I don't know if you want to stop filming, but you had told me about the comment you had made earlier about we were trying to place the camera appropriately, but also there comes a time where people have to be on camera. Thank you. So just wanted you to know that.
Thank you. Okay. Well, are we ready to adjourn? Somebody want to make a motion? I made a motion to adjourn. Second. Somebody second it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay.